You caught me working on a batch of holdfasts today. Welcome back to Black Bear Forge. Now since I've got some customers that are waiting for their holdfasts and I have a few more of these I need to wire brush and then I need to get them packed and shipped out, I probably won't get to an actual forging video today, but I did think it would be a good opportunity to answer some of the questions people have and just do a little Q&A video today. Now frequently I'm getting the same types of questions, people asking about forges, people asking about anvils, things of that sort, so I thought I would address a little bit about my forge, why I don't use the coal forge so much, what the status of the ribbon burner project is, that kind of stuff, as well as talking about my anvil, what brand it is, how old it is, how heavy it is, why my hardy tools don't fit tight, and things like that that people ask quite often on this channel. So we're going to address some of those things, maybe answer a few other questions, and then I'm going to get back to work on the holdfasts. Oh, by the way, somebody's probably already thinking, boy, is it dangerous to run a cut brush on an angle grinder. This isn't actually an angle grinder. It's a sander polisher, so it has adjustable speeds. And I run it at about 4,000 RPM instead of the 10,000 RPM that an angle grinder runs. And the brushes are rated for 9,000 RPM. So it's plenty safe to run that brush at that speed. Still got to wear your eye protection, your hearing protection, and, and a leather apron is really helpful because it'll still throw some bristles. Some of the other questions that I get asked all the time are about things like hot mill gloves, hook rulers, and silver pencils. Now the hot mill gloves are a Carolina hot mill glove with a cuff, they're a Kevlar glove, and I buy these from Paytool, although I think Blacksmith Depot probably has them, Centaur Forge might have them, I think Oleo Acres carries them. Lots of the blacksmithing suppliers carry these, but they are the Kevlar glove, and because I am right-handed, I buy two or three times as many lefts, and they are often sold as lefts only, rights only, or in pairs. So that's kind of handy. And there are links down in the video description to those suppliers. The silver pencils are a Mark All Silver Streak. It's a lead holder with a silver pencil lead, so it's kind of a mechanical pencil. And I just dropped the last little bit of lead on the floor, so I'll have to put a new lead in it. And these are available at most welding suppliers or industrial suppliers. Occasionally I list these on my Etsy shop, but they aren't real profitable for me to list over there because I still have to buy them at retail. I don't qualify to wholesale these things. I don't buy enough of them. But it might be worth taking a look over there if you can't find them anywhere else. But do check your local welding shop or online welding suppliers. They ought to have these. The hook rulers are just made out of a framing square, and I did a video on those, and I'll link to that video right up here. And if you want to make a hook ruler out of a little square, actually these are smaller than framing square. I think I use an 8 by 12 square for these, but it's all explained in that video. Now over the years, probably my most asked questions here on the channel have to do with my anvil. How heavy is my anvil? What brand is my anvil? Where did my anvil come from? Where can I get one just like it? Now my belief is that this is an old hay button anvil. It isn't actually marked hay button. It has a hardware store name stamped in it. Really hard to read. I don't remember exactly what it says right now. But my understanding is that companies like hay button, Peter Wright, and some of the other manufacturers would stamp the name of the store that was selling them, if they were buying enough anvils, they would go ahead and do that. So that it was whatever hardware company was selling the anvil got their name. I'm sure some of them were stamped Sears and Roebuck. Even the ones that said Acme might have been made by Hay Budden or Peter Wright back in the day, but don't quote me on that. This was marked with soapstone as a 308 pound anvil when I bought it. I took the guy's word for it. I have not put it on a scale, but I'm pretty sure that's pretty darn close to what it weighs. And it's really a pretty good anvil. It's good and solid. When it is an acre to the stump, it has a good nice ring to it. For those of you who like an anvil that rings, it's got really good rebound to it. Not bad, but it's not in the best of shape. This has been repaired at some point over the years. These edges have been re-welded. When I got it, you couldn't really see signs of the weld, but as I use it, you can see where the weld is starting to wear out and it's softer than the face of the anvil. And you can see the, the weld line here where somebody re-welded it. They really did a pretty good job. And this is a real tough thing to do. I re-welded one once. I will never do that again. I would rather buy a new anvil than spend a week welding, grinding, re-welding, re-grinding, and trying to get it right. Partly because you end up with little things like this seam here that you can see. And people frequently say, oh, your anvil is cracking, the face is coming off. No, that's just a lousy weld where it didn't seal up real well. And whoever was doing it didn't bother to go back and fix that. But another problem with this having been welded is either they didn't do a good job grinding it when they welded it, 
or it significantly softened the outer edges of the anvil so that they wear faster. And now my anvil has a crown in it. And it's flat across here, but here and here it dips off some. And depending on where you are, that's different in different spots of the anvil. And that can be kind of annoying sometimes. One of these days I need to grind this flat again and get it all cleaned up. The horn is all dinged up, and of course the step is. The steps are almost always dinged up. And all of that needs to be reground. Now another thing people feel compelled to comment on with regards to my anvil is the fact that most of my hardy tools fit a little bit loose. And that's simply because this is an older anvil. The holes were punched hot. These are forged. They weren't machined anvils. So the holes are rarely straight and square to start with. But over the years, it has worn odd. And if you get a tool like this that fits really well in one direction, it may not fit at all in the other direction. So by the time you get a hardy shank that fits all four directions, the tools usually end up kind of loose. Now another problem that I have with regard to hardy tools is that I buy used tools quite often. I buy things at blacksmithing get-togethers, antique stores, flea markets, whatever, and frequently the tools just aren't sized for this. Yes, you can mess around with them, you can adapt them, you can do all sorts of different things. I could sleeve this and make it a little bit smaller hardy hole and then grind all my tools down to fit. Might be worth doing, but probably not in my book. I honestly think the loose tools bother you guys out there way more than they will ever bother me. And of course, the next category of questions that people want to ask about a lot are forges. Everybody's trying to figure out what the best forge for their situation is. Should I have coal or should I have propane? Should I build a campfire and use a hair dryer? What should I be using in my shop? And that's a question I really can't answer. But I will tell you why I use a propane forge more than I use a coal forge. The coal forge is still here. I still have coal. All I've got to do is move the propane forge aside if, when I come in in the morning and I can build a coal fire or a charcoal fire or a coke fire. This forge will burn all three of those fuels depending on what I have available. So perhaps we should just refer to it as a solid fuel forge because just about any forge will burn all three of those fuels. There's nothing really special about the forge design. The main reason that I use propane 90, 95% of the time is that good quality coal is really hard to come by in our area. If you can get it, it's expensive. For the most part, you have to have it shipped, which adds to the expense of the coal. So coal costs me... A, least two times as much per hour of burn time as burning propane. Coal also means you have to clean out the fire. You've got to shovel coal. You've got to bring coal in. You've got to maintain the fire. While you're working throughout the day, you have to stop and clean the fire and tend the fire. That's all stuff that costs time. In the propane forge, I can put two or three or four bars in, depending on what I'm working in. There's some things that I might put a dozen bars of steel in here. I don't have to worry about any of that overheating like you do in a coal forge. They're all going to get pretty evenly hot, depending on the hot and cool spots in the propane forge. But it's not at all like a coal forge is. It's going to have one really hot spot and everything else is a little off. And if you walk off and leave it with the blower running, you're going to burn stuff up. Don't have to worry about any of that in the propane forge. So I probably get at least three times as much work done in an hour working out of the propane forge because of that. So that means that I am probably five or six times more efficient, more productive in my day in the shop because I run a propane forge. It's not the end-all be-all. I like working out of a coal forge. Who doesn't like tending fire? It goes back to when we were Boy Scouts and we sat around the campfire poking it with a stick. But I am trying to run a business for the most part, and propane really suits the way I work better than coal does. At one point in time, I had a shop where I never bothered to put a chimney in. I worked for two or three years in that shop exclusively in propane. It really didn't bother me. I didn't miss it that much. I don't miss the coal forge too much here. But I would like to experiment with burning charcoal more because we have so many trees around here that need to be thinned out that I'm going to have a lot of wood that would be easy to make into charcoal. Unfortunately, here it is April and we are already under a fire ban this year, so I may not be able to make any charcoal this year. But if I can, I think we'll make a video about it. That then brings up the subject of the ribbon burner forge, and I introduced this project quite some time ago. I'll link to that video up here, although it's become somewhat of an irrelevant video because I haven't done anything else with it since that video. Does that mean the Ribbon Burner Forge project is off the books? Of course it doesn't. It's just something I haven't had time to work on. It isn't a huge priority here in the shop because the Chili Forge is such an awesome forge 
that I just don't have to build the new forge until I feel like I have the time to do it. And I'd like to probably just set a whole week aside where I don't have to worry about customer orders. And sorry, don't really have to worry too much about videos to just worry about the ribbon burner forge. Now I will make videos about it, but I'm not gonna let the camera run the whole time. I'm not gonna make other videos during that time period. I just wanna concentrate on getting it done. I have most of the pieces, most of the parts. I've got this rolling cart that's gonna be ideal to build it onto that's not doing anything else right now, so I might as well use it to put the ribbon burner forge on. I was originally gonna make it out of this old chunk of air compressor tank, but after seeing some other people's forges that are made with much heavier material and are holding up way better than a lot of gas forges do, I think I'm probably going to order some heavier material from my steel supplier. And that means that I'm going to either have to go to town, which right now going to town and being around a bunch of other people isn't always the best idea, or I'm going to have to have it delivered. But I need some other materials, and if they'll deliver out here and not charge me an arm and a leg to do it, then I'll get some measurements, I'll figure that out, I'll decide exactly what I need to build this forge, and I'll get the materials, but probably it's going to be a few months. It'll probably be at least midsummer, so I don't have to worry about refractory freezing. This morning it was only 6 degrees, so it's still getting cold enough to freeze, and I'm not sure if the refractory wants to be worked at that cold a temperature. So yes, I plan to finish the ribbon burner forge, but I don't know exactly when that's going to be. So that's just a quick look at some of the most asked questions that I get here on the channel. There are lots of other questions, and as I get more of those, maybe we'll do some more of these videos. Right now, I know a lot of you are at home, you're social distancing, you're working from home. Maybe you're out of work right now, which is really regrettable, but you're trying to find something to do with your time, and YouTube videos and things that inspire you to get out to the shop might be just what you're looking for. So I'm going to try and put out a few more videos in the next month, two months, whatever it takes to get us through this phase. I can't promise anything because I'm still trying to produce customer orders. Luckily, those are still coming in, so I'm not hurting too bad. And if you've got your own small little shop, hopefully you're finding an outlet for some of your stuff without having to go set up at the local fair or craft show this year. So if there's something that you would like me to address that I can do in a short video, frankly, the typical project videos. I frequently spend about 8 to 12 hours working on one of those, and I can't do one of those every single day. But I can do little videos like this. I can talk about a specific tool. I can talk about a specific technique. So if there are things like that that you would like to see, put a comment down there in the comment section. Let me know what you'd like to see in the next few months. And I'm going to try and go back to more regular videos, even though my goal this year was initially to cut back and do more involved, more detailed videos. That may just be one of the things that's on hold during this current crisis. I do hope everybody is finding a way to get through these tough times and that you're managing to survive, keep food on the table, keep a roof over your head, and that you can keep a little bit of motivation to get out to the shop. If you enjoyed this video, by all means, give it a thumbs up. Would love it if you hit that subscribe button down there. Feel free to stick around, watch as many of the videos as you like. Hopefully you have time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but make sure you're washing your hands, not touching your face, wear your safety glasses, and we will see you for the next one. <music>